Welcome to worship this beautiful morning, this July summer day. We have the wonderful uh, honor and privilege to uh, welcome our guest preacher, uh, Ginny Smith, and she will be uh, bringing the word forth uh, today. Welcome to worship, and may God uh, bless you as we enter uh, into his praise this day. life into our singing, our praying, our speaking, our listening. In our worship, we reach out to you, O God, knowing that you have already enfolded us in your arms. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Gently bear. 
rescues us from all our foes. Alleluia, alleluia, widely yet his mercy flows. Angels help us to Love is patient for our quick temperedness, Lord have mercy. Love is kind for our indifference towards others, Lord have mercy. Love is not envious for our petty jealousies, Lord have mercy. Love is not boastful for our pretentiousness, Lord have mercy. Love is not arrogant for our opinionated views, Lord have mercy. Love is not rude for our impolite behavior, Lord, have mercy. Love is not irritable for our resentful behavior. Lord, have mercy. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing for our rejoicing in all the wrong things. Lord, have mercy. May God show us mercy, forgive us our sins, and lead us to life that loves. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. Brothers and sisters, hear this good news. As far as the east is from the west, God removes our sin and remembers it no more. Hear and receive this good news in Christ. We are forgiven and made whole. Amen. i
our scripture reading for today is taken from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. We will be reading from the 13th chapter, a very familiar chapter. Listen for the word of God. If I speak in tongues of human beings and of angels, but I don't have love, I'm a clanging gong or a clashing cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and I know all mysteries and everything else, and if I have such complete faith that I can move mountains, but I don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give away everything that I have and hand over my own body to feel good about what I've done, but I don't have love, I receive no benefit whatsoever. Love is patient, love is kind. It isn't jealous, it doesn't brag, it isn't arrogant. Love isn't rude, it doesn't seek its own advantage, it isn't irritable, it doesn't keep a record of complaints. It isn't happy with injustice, but it is happy with the truth. Love puts up with all things, <laughs> trusts in all things, hopes in all things, endures all things. Love never fails. As with prophecies, they're gonna be brought to an end. As for tongues, they will stop. As for knowledge, it will be brought to an end. We know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, what is partial will be brought to an end. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, reason like a child, think like a child. But now that I have become a man, I've put an end to childish things. Now we see a reflection in a mirror. Then we will see face to face. Now I know partially, but then I will know completely in the same way that I have been completely known. Now faith, hope, love remain. These three things, and the greatest of these is love. This is the word of the Lord. Corinth in Paul's day was much like New York City and Philadelphia, <clears throat> Chicago in our day. It was a large urban center and it was teeming with diverse groups of people. There was ethnic and racial diversity, there was cultural diversity, and there was definitely religious diversity. And the Apostle Paul had gone to this metropolis of diversity to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. And the result of this missionary activity of Paul's was a church, a congregation that was just as diverse as Corinth itself. And this presented a problem, problem that, a problem that caused the the breakdown of the church commun of, of that church community with one faction fighting another. People of diverse economic and cultural backgrounds were brought together. They were brought into relationship with one another through their common faith in Jesus Christ. And the issue became this. The issue became, how are they going to relate? How will they relate to each other? Diversity in any group can raise tremendous anxiety, but churches are particularly vulnerable. Our religious beliefs are at the very heart, the very core of who we are. Our religious de uh, beliefs define who we are. And if someone holds a different belief or wants to do something that is different from that with which we are accustomed, 
we become anxious. We become fearful that if the other is included, then we're going to be excluded. Or if they're right, I must be wrong. Very dualistic thinking. As a pastor, Paul was worried. Paul was very concerned about these people whom he loved. And here were all of these new Christians hungry to learn more about Jesus Christ. These new Christians wanting to grow and deepen their faith. And the bickering and the pettiness were preventing them from doing just that. Now, someone else in Corinth must have been just as concerned about this as Paul was. And so they contacted Paul. And this letter that we read today, this portion, is a result of that person's letter. This is Paul writing back because he was so concerned. He wanted to address their anxieties and the anxieties that were very present in this situation. It is important, he tells them, in the passage just before the one we read, that you are the body of Christ. And each one of you has his or her own spiritual special gifts given by the Holy Spirit to be used for the building up of Christ's body. No one, no one is to deny anyone else at all the opportunity to use their gifts. Every person's gift is necessary. Necessary, Paul says, for the church, for the church as the body of Christ to be complete. No one is to be excluded. Everyone is to be included. And herein lies the challenge. The challenge to all of us who profess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, to all of us who are Christ's disciples. I call it Christ's challenge of inclusion. It's the challenge that the Corinthians faced as in their fear and anxiety, they argued and argued over people who didn't speak in tongues. That's what this chapter is talking about. It was the challenge that the religious leaders had in Jesus' time. Do you remember the one situation in Jesus' hometown when he was faced with the fear and anxiety of the people who even knew him? And they drove him out of town and they wanted to hurl him over a cliff. It's amazing, isn't it, what fear and anxiety will do to people? Because you see, that's what we're living with. And this is our challenge today as well. Meeting Christ's challenge of welcome and hospitality to all people, no matter who they are, is difficult. And it's difficult because it's easier to work with people whom we perceive to be like us, whatever, whatever that like us might be. Now, Paul knew this about people. But he also knew this. He knew that God had built diversity right into Christ's body. And in addition, Paul knew that with so much diversity, there was bound to be disagreements. And so he makes it very clear, very clear, that there's one bond, one bond that holds the church as the body of Christ together. And that bond is Christian love. Plain and simple. This is what holds the body together. Frederick Beekner, in his book called Wishful Thinking, defines love this way, and I'm quoting. In the Christian sense, love is not primarily an emotion, but an act of the will. When Jesus tells us to love our neighbors, he is not telling us to love them in the sense of responding to them with a cozy emotional feeling. On the contrary, he is telling us to love our neighbors, Beekner goes on, love our neighbors in the sense of being willing to work for their well-being, even if it means sacrificing our well-being so that that can happen. 
Yeah, that's what we're talking about with Christian love. The love that Paul is talking about here in 1 Corinthians 13 is a love that can bind us together because this kind of love is powerful. And this love is powerful because it has its origins in God. It is love that is powered, powered by the Holy Spirit. And because of this, Love brings completeness to the various gifts that the Christ body possesses because of all of us, all Christians who are a part of that body. And love has the power to put aside self-interest and focus us on the well-being of the other individual, the other person, and ultimately the well-being of the entire church and indeed beyond that to the community and beyond that to the reign of God in this world. It's important to recognize, my brothers and sisters, that seeking the well-being of others does spring from a unique self-awareness, from seeing ourselves as loved lavishly and unequivocally by God, and then seeing others as loved children of God as well. When Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? He told, his, told the questioner, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, your strength, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. We can't love others until we love ourselves. Love ourselves as God loves us. Exactly, exactly as we are. Yeah, and the church as the body of Christ cannot be held together and make a difference in this world until we can own the fact, the fact that God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. Otherwise, new ideas and different ways of doing things cause us great anxiety and great fear rather than us being able to see, to see these new ideas and new different ways of doing things as opportunities that the Spirit gives. These opportunities that the Spirit gives to extend ministry in Christ's name, extending that ministry to people and places where it has never gone before. So what do we do? What can we do? Well, we're told in 1 John, John's first letter, Fourth chapter, 18th verse, crucial verse. It's one of my favorites. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. And that perfect love is expressed in Jesus Christ himself. When Jesus Christ is Lord of our lives, we then can affirm the person God created us to be. We can let the love of God work in and work through us. And Jesus is showing us a new way of seeing ourselves in relationship with others. This love that Jesus models and the love of which <clears throat> Paul speaks is a way of acting. It's a way of acting. Love does not insist on its own way. Just because we don't like that the certain rule or whatever is in place, if that is going to benefit the largest number of people, that's where God wants us to be and how God wants us to act. Look around at what's going on in our culture and in the world today with this pandemic. Let's make sure that we're taking care of each other and not just just ourselves, because we think this is the way it's got to be. You see, 
Christian love is being so comfortable with ourselves and our own beliefs that we respect the beliefs of others. We respect other people and seeing that somehow, some way, through our discussions, through our conversations, we can just come closer to what God is saying, what God is doing, closer to God's truth. And Jesus is showing us a new way of seeing, a new way of recognizing God, a new way of recognizing God's reign at the heart of everything that exists. So let's be open. Let's be open, my brothers and sisters, to the working of the Holy Spirit in our lives and in our church. And then let us trust the movement of the Spirit. Let us be open to where the Spirit wants to take us. How does the Spirit want us to be together as a church and then out in the community and out in the world? Because remember, there is no more creative and imaginative being, whatever, than the Holy Spirit. There's no one more creative and imaginative than the Holy Spirit who is continually creating and recreating the world and our lives from the generative power of God's redeeming love. Oh, we're so blessed. It is God's love working in our lives that will allow the Spirit to flow, allow the Spirit to flow through us as individuals, flow through us as a church, so that we as individuals and as a body can touch the lives of everyone, everyone whom God gives us to love and to serve. Amen.
friends, join with me in prayer. Your love, O oh God, is patient. We give you thanks for all those who have been patient with us and have taught and cared for us. And we pray for the patience to love others as you have loved us. Your love, O oh God, is kind. Give us the courage to be kind to others and to serve those with patience, those who are unkind, rude, difficult to love, or our enemies. They are your children and our sisters and brothers, and they are made in your image. Your love is not rude or arrogant. Give us insight to speak the truth in love. Help us to hear truth without defensiveness, to receive your truth, even if it comes from an enemy. Please, uh, please give us the humility to listen to you. Your love does not seek its own interests. We thank you and pray for those who serve the poor and those in need. Help us to give of our resources, but in, more importantly, to give of ourselves. Your love is not quick-tempered. We pray for those who are angry and for the violent and for their victims, for children who fear, elders who are abused, and people trapped in relationships that injure and harm. Your love bears all things, and we remember before you those with heavy burdens, many cares, much stress, and too little comfort and help. Open our eyes to those around us and their needs, and give us the wisdom to be their intercessors. Your love never fails. Even death does not trespass on the breadth and depth of your love. We thank you for those who have loved us in this life and who now dwell in the peace and joy of your presence and let your comfort settle on those who are bereaved or who are lonely this day. Now let us pray our family prayer that Jesus taught us, calling God our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May the countenance of God be lifted up to you. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.